maybe what I will do is just, first of all, recall some of what I said in the first two lectures. So we talked about nil sequences and Gower's norms. And at the end of last time, I stated the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms. Uh, so let me just state that again. Suppose that f is a function from the first n integers to c, bounded everywhere by 1. And suppose that it's Gower's norm it's kth Gower's norm is at least delta. Uh, then the conclusion is that f correlates with a nil sequence. Then there is a nil sequence chi of n, which is an automorphic function phi of a polynomial sequence, such that the average of f of n times chi of n is at least delta primed. And here, so where delta primed is bigger than zero, and various complexity quantities connected with chi are bounded. So there is a basis B for the Lie algebra. of G, um, such that this notion of complexity that I defined before is bounded. And the smoothness of phi is bounded. Um, and actually, there was one thing I forgot last time. Also, the dimension of G is bounded. Um, so the way to think about this is to not worry too much about the last three lines. So this, all of this, I mean, it's important to do things rigorously, but you should just think bounded complexity. So I said last time that this is a very difficult theorem to prove, but that the converse is somewhat easier. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the converse, which explains somehow, at least a, a bit, why nil sequences are important. So today um, we'll talk about the converse. Session. Um, and the crucial fact here is so the crucial observation is that nil sequences behave a little bit like polynomials. So under favorable circumstances, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, the derivative of a nil sequence is a nil sequence of degree one lower, of step one lower. So the derivative delta sub h chi of n, which is chi of n, chi of n plus h bar, 
is a nil sequence. of step of class s minus 1 if chi is a nil sequence of class s. Uh, so in this respect, nil sequences, well, they behave like polynomial phases. So for example, so this is a familiar fact. For certain special cases, um, namely the polynomial phases, So if I take uh, chi of n to be e to the 2 pi i alpha n squared, for example, such as, um, I mentioned before that this is a nil sequence. So this is a nil sequence of class 2, um, in which the underlying group g is just the reals. Uh, the lattice gamma is the integers. The automorphic function, well, the, the polynomial, p of n, is alpha n squared. And then phi of x is e of x, which, let me remind you, is e to the 2 pi i times x. So it, it is a nil sequence of class 2. Uh, what's its derivative in the sense that I just defined there? Delta sub h chi of n is e of alpha n squared minus n plus h squared. And the point is that for fixed h, um, let me just make it clear that this is for fixed h. So the derivative is e to the minus 2 alpha n h times a constant, c h. And uh, that's a linear nil sequence. So this is. Uh, a class one nil sequence for fixed h. In fact, this is just a, an additive character. Um, in fact, an additive character. So what I claim is true is that there's a complete generalization of this observation to arbitrary nil sequences. Um, maybe I'll just mention another example. This is a, I'll leave this as a, a not very easy exercise. So exercise, and this is definitely a bit tricky. Um, convince yourself that so if chi of n is e of alpha n times brackets beta n, uh, then the same is true. So delta sub h chi of n is a class 1 nil sequence. Um, I mentioned this particular nil sequence before. It comes from the Heisenberg group. So recall that chi comes from Heisenberg. Um, and it was actually not quite a genuine nil sequence because the, the, <coughs> phi, the phi was discontinuous. So phi was discontinuous, but this doesn't actually matter. 
this isn't important. So that's, uh, that's already quite a tricky exercise. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, so to explain why this is so, I need to say a little bit more about these polynomial, uh, polynomial sequences. Um, so let me state formally a proposition. So I'm going to just describe various equivalent forms of what it means to be a polynomial sequence. So let G uh, be a G bullet be a prefiltration. And suppose that P from Z to G is just some map. Uh, then the following are equivalent. So first of all, is that G is a polynomial, P is a polynomial sequence um, in the sense that I defined before. So that is to say that P is a product um, P of n is a product of gi to the pin, where um, gi is in g of the degree of pi. So that's the definition we saw before. Uh, next is that the derivatives of p behave a bit like a polynomial. So delta sub h1 delta sub hk p of n takes values in g sub k for all integers k and all choices of h1 up to hk and n in the integers. Um, and I want to mention, so I, I, I don't think I'm going to have time to prove this. I, I mentioned this before and I said that this is a quite a non-trivial fact. So for the, f the objects satisfying one are obviously a group, but the same is far less clear for objects satisfying two. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to have time um, to give the proof in full. But I do want to mention, I mean, there are two other equivalent properties, morning, uh, which are useful inside the proof. But it relies, well, it relies really on one other, on um, a further equivalent property. Which is three. Um, that for every n and h, the 
2 to the k tuple, p of n plus omega h, has omega ranges over 0, 1 to the k. So that takes values in something called the host kra cube group. It takes values in a certain subgroup. of um, g to the 0, 1 to the k called the Hostkra cube group. Um, hk sub k of g bullet. And I'll at least tell you what it is. So this is the group generated by by all elements of the form uh, Well, what I'll write, g to the square omega. So this is um, so this is the element that's defined by uh, g to the omega sub epsilon is equal to g if epsilon is <coughs> contained in omega, so dominated by omega, and is equal to the identity otherwise. And g um, lies in a certain <coughs> element of this filtration. So it's quite difficult to explain why this is important. Maybe if I draw a picture, this will make a certain amount more sense. Good job I have thin wrists. So you, you can, um, the Hosskra cube group of dimension three you can think of it as, as eight tuples in the group. So one thing I could do is uh, I could have g, 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 and g. So this is the element that I'd call g to the uh, 1, 1, 1. So it's just everything on the, uh, every vertex of the cube is g. And here, so for any g in, um, in g0, so that's just any g whatsoever. So all of those element, elements are in the Hosskra cube group. Um, but I can also have things like this. So I could have um, g primed, g primed, and then everything else is the identity. So this would be g primed to the uh, one, zero, zero, and I'm allowed this for any g primed in uh, g2. So this is a certain group, and somehow the combinatorics of polynomial sequences and nilpotent groups 
is intimately related to the combinatorics of these cubes and how they multiply and commutate together. As I say, it's, yeah, it would take me a whole lecture to develop this, but what I, ha I do actually have full printed notes on this, by the way. If anyone wants them, uh, just send me an email um, and I'll give you the, actually I've got notes for all three of the lectures that I've given this week. Anyway, so there's a proposition about different equivalences of what it means to be a polynomial sequence. OK, so now I'm going to explain a little bit this. So the statement that if, uh, if I have a nil sequence and conditions are favorable, uh, then its derivative is a nil sequence of class 1 less. So favorable turns out to mean that the automorphic function phi has just a certain additional invariance. So favorable means that uh, phi is additionally invariant uh, which we call having a vertical frequency. Uh, so what this means is, so if chi from the last element, the last non-trivial element of the filtration is a homomorphism onto the multiplicative complexes character, continuous homomorphism, and if it annihilates um, if it annihilates the lattice, so annihilating the lattice intersect G sub S, then we say it's a vertical character and phi has psi as a vertical frequency uh, precisely if phi of x gs is equal to psi of gs phi of x for all x in the group and for all central elements, uh, well, for all elements GS in big GS. So maybe I should remark explicitly, so NB, um, G sub S is in the center of G. And uh, that's because I've got a filtration. And so the commutator of G with GS is supposed to be contained within GS plus 1. Uh, but that is, by assumption, trivial, um, because I've got a, a filtration of class S. So think of this as an automorphic function phi that has some additional variance in the center. And I gave two examples at the top, and those both do have a vertical frequency. So both of the examples do have 
um, a vertical frequency. So furthermore, you can kind of do a Fourier expansion just in, in the direction of this central group GS uh, to decompose an arbitrary automorphic function phi into automorphic functions having a vertical frequency. So by a kind of uh, vertical Fourier expansion, we can write uh, phi is as a sum over psi of phi psi, uh, where phi psi has psi as a vertical frequency. And in fact, well, I, I may come back to this and mention it again later. So for for this to be useful, we need to know some additional things about this. So we'll need to know how the complexity of this phi psi depends on that of phi. And we'd also need to have some rapid decay. But these are the same, all the ideas are the same as when you decompose a smooth function into its Fourier modes. And the proofs are also the same. Uh, but for now, let's just think that this is just an additional invariance that it's not very difficult to attain um, in any given case. Any questions at all before I carry on? All right. So let me try and explain then why the derivative of a nil sequence with a vertical character is a nil sequence of lower class. So let's look at the derivative. There is, um, there is not much difficulty in interpreting uh, the derivative delta sub h chi of n, which is chi of n chi of n plus h bar as a nil sequence. So in fact, it's equal to phi times phi bar of p of n, p of n plus h. So you can think of it as a nil sequence on g cross g. So on g cross g, uh, with filtration uh, in which g cross g sub i is gi cross gi. And um, well, I suppose it's not, it's not completely trivial. So indeed, for fixed h, um, pn plus h is also a polynomial sequence. adapted to the same filtration on uh, G bullet uh, because it is, well, it's the derivative delta sub H P of N inverse times P of N. And P of N is a polynomial sequence adapted to G, and so is the derivative um, by part two. Uh, 
and hence the product is also a polynomial sequence. So here I've really used the proposition. So at least the derivative is a null sequence. But unfortunately, I've not proved anything like this observation here because uh, the null sequence is more complicated. The situation is more complicated than the one I started with. I've simply taken a direct product of two groups of class S. So unfortunately, Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, G cross G is a bigger group. So also with class uh, S. So that's unfortunate. But you can make some small modifications in such a way that this actually lives inside a smaller group. So by making some small modifications, we can ensure uh, we can pass to a smaller group. So I claim in particular that in fact uh, the sequence P of n, P of n plus h, I can multiply that through by a constant which is pretty harmless. So P of 0, P of h inverse. Let me just check I've got that correct. Oh no, sorry, before I do that. Let me not do it, yeah. So I'm actually going to first pass to a smaller filtration before I pass to a smaller group. So in fact, this already, the pair P of n, P of n plus h already lies inside a smaller filtration. So I claim, so let's write, so I'll write P of n, P of n plus h is uh, A of n inverse times B of n, where, so A of n is going to be just the identity and then the derivative of P at n and B of n will be just p of n, p of n. So that's straightforward. Um, and both of those sequences lie in much smaller groups. So the, uh, the kth derivative that delta h1 uh, delta hk b of n takes values in, let's write a j, an i, uh, takes values in gi diagonal. 
which is just instead of all pairs, g g for g in g i. So that's obvious. B is in the diagonal of g, so its derivatives are all in the diagonal. And uh, the derivative of a, well, the derivatives of a, the ith derivative of a is essentially an i plus first derivative of p. So that takes values in, uh, in g in the identity cross g sub i plus 1 being an i plus first derivative of p. So by the product property, um, so therefore, the product Well, that is to say, the sequence p of n, p of n plus h, has its ith derivative lying in, well, the group that you get by taking the group generated by those two groups, which I will call uh, g i cross sub g i plus 1 g i. And that's just precisely the set of all pairs g, g primed uh, with g, g primed in g, i. And, um, and these two things being equivalent mod g, i plus 1. So it turns out that that sequence of groups that I've defined gives you a filtration on the product g cross g. And it's a finer filtration than merely the product filtration. So this gives, well, it's not a filtration yet. It's actually a, a pre-filtration. It gives a pre-filtration um, on g cross g. So that's an exercise. It's really just a, a simple group theory exercise. You just need to check that the commutator of elements there does what you think it does, it has the appropriate filtration property. So to make a filtration, I need to to get a filtration, there's a little trick. Uh, we just multiply through by a constant. So we consider instead uh, the sequence So I'll instead consider the sequence uh, p of n, p of n plus h. This is what I started writing before, times p of 0, p of h inverse. So because it's just the previous sequence times a constant, the derivatives are essentially the same. So this also has derivatives. So it also has ith derivatives. Uh, taking values in uh, gi cross sub gi plus 1 gi. Uh, but now the sequence itself takes values in the first 
So the sequence itself will take values in uh, uh, G1 cross sub G2, G1, uh, which is just the same thing as G cross sub G2, G. Um, that's not difficult to prove. Let me just write it down. I, I, it's sort of half an exercise, half, a, half an actual proof. So I, it wasn't as quite as straightforward as I thought. So to prove this, so what one does is observe that um, the following. Pn plus h times Pn inverse is equal to, sorry, Ph inverse is equal to the derivative n P of h inverse uh, times the derivative n P of 0 times P of n P of 0. inverse, so that's just an identity. But then um, this, so delta n p h inverse, delta n p of 0 differs from up to a commutator, I can swap the order of these. So it differs from delta n p of 0 and delta n p of h inverse by a commutator. Uh, which lies in certainly lies in g2. Um, and this is, in fact, the derivative delta h, delta n, p of 0. It's a second derivative, which also lies in g2. So I bet you there's a simpler, I mean, that's not very hard, but there's probably a simpler way to see that, so I'll have to think about that. Anyway, so now we have a polynomial sequence which lies inside a filtration on this group here. Maybe I should remind you what I'm trying to do here. And so remember what I'm trying to do is understand why the derivative of a nil sequence is a nil sequence of lower class. And what I've done so far is interpret the derivative of a nil sequence as a null sequence on this group here. Now, you can probably guess that I'm not finished because I haven't actually used the fact that phi has a vertical character. So if you remember that I talked about this notion of vertical character, I've not made any use of that yet. Actually, let me. So that group, unfortunately, still has class S. So unfortunately, G cross G2, G, still has class S. And in fact, the, the S, the S, the, that's extremely hard to say. I know that TH is supposed to be hard to say for French people, so I don't know if 
Esther. This must be very hard to say. Yes, so it still has class S. The S term in the filtration is, um, well, it's GS cross GS plus 1, GS. And that's just the diagonal of GS. But it turns out that the vertical frequency of phi is precisely what lets us mod out by that diagonal and hence pass to a class S minus 1 group. So however, phi has a vertical frequency. Uh, xi. And so, well, um, phi cross phi bar of gs gs x y if you just compute away is going to be um, phi of g of s x phi of g of s y bar and that will be Psi of gs phi of x, <coughs> psi bar of gs phi of y bar, and of course that's just phi times phi bar um, of x y. So phi times phi bar descends to a function. phi times phi bar descends to a function on, um, on a group that I will call the square of g. So g square, which is defined to be g cross g2, g, mod by the center, by the diagonal of the center. And this is, which has class uh, S minus 1. So here's an exercise that you if, you, if you want to check your understanding of these concepts. When G is the Heisenberg group, what is the square? So exercise. Uh, if G is the Heisenberg 1, 1, 1, R, 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 then the square is isomorphic to R cubed. The Heisenberg group, of course, is not isomorphic to R cubed. OK. Um, well, there's more that needs to be said in this discussion, but I don't think I'm going to say it. Uh, I'm going to just state a final theorem. What more needs to be said? Well, one problem is that um, So actually, I mean, there's a slight inaccuracy here. When I multiplied on the right by this constant here, p of naught, p of h inverse, I have to correspondingly modify the automorphic function phi cross phi bar by turning it, in fact, to, uh, let me just briefly sketch this. I, I'd, in fact, need to instead consider um, phi cross phi bar of x, y um, times p naught, p h inverse. 
so times um, So maybe I should have said that, but it, it makes the notation worse. But the problem is that um, no one said that these p naught and pH are in any way nicely bounded. And the, there's no right invariance of the Sobolev norms that I used last time. So what this means is that if p of naught and, and p of h are very, very big, then actually the smoothness norms of this phi cross phi bar could blow up hugely. And uh, that's problematic. You want them to be bounded. So you need to do some extra tricks, essentially conjugating by elements of the lattice to make these elements smaller again. But then things start becoming even harder to understand. So I'm just going to say that there are some further things that you need to do, and then state a final theorem. So theorem, uh, let chi of n equals phi of p of n be a nil sequence of class S with a vertical frequency psi then its derivative so the derivative delta h chi of n which is chi of n chi of n plus h bar may be interpreted as That can be interpreted as a nil sequence uh, phi sub h box p sub h box of n on g box, uh, which is defined to be this group. So that's a, a group of filtered group of class S minus 1 <coughs> with the filtration I mentioned before. And furthermore, with more care, uh, with some additional arguments, Uh, one may ensure, one may bound the, the, um, the smoothness norms of phi h box um, in terms of those of phi nicely. in terms of those of phi. So of course, there's a more precise statement that needs to be made there, uh, but that's, that's the basic idea. Um, does anyone want any further elaboration of any of that? I'm guessing no. <laughs> well. There's a lot more that can be said, but if you, if you really want to see it, I have, I have all these notes on it. <laughs>
giving the precise, precise bounds for all of those noise. <coughs> But what I want to explain to you now then is why this fact, so this is saying that null sequences behave in many ways like polynomials, why this implies that they are obstructions to what we call Gower's uniformity. So in other words, if you correlate with a null sequence, then you have a large Gower's norm. So that's the converse to the inverse theorem. or the Gower's norms. So in fact, well, it's useful to introduce something called the Gower's dual norm. So we introduce the dual norms and the dual norms so the dual norm of a, a function, psi uk n star, is by definition the supremum over all f with uh, just with bounded u2 norm. Banded L2 norm. No, sorry, supremum over all f with banded Gower's norm, uk n equals 1, of the inner product of f with psi. So this is actually, this is just the standard construction of the dual of a norm. So this is, uh, this construction works. For any norm, in fact, and it gives another norm. So the statement, i.e., the converse to the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms is the statement that null sequences have a small dual norm. So that's the theorem. Uh, so the theorem is we have if chi is a nil sequence, uh, that the dual norm of class S, uh, the dual S plus one norm. is bounded by a suitable smoothness norm of uh, phi. Um, I forget. I worked out at some point how many you need. The number of derivatives you need depends on, um, it's not terribly important, but the, the number of derivatives you need does depend on the dimension of the group G and also on S. I think 2 to the S times the dimension of G is going to be enough. Um, so this statement is true. Well, you also need to take account of the complexity of uh, G mod gamma. So this will depend on, on S and uh, the complexity of the null sequence. 
But the basic idea is that a fixed nil sequence has a bounded Gower's dual norm, and therefore, so that is um, nil sequences obstruct Gower's uniformity or to spell it out even more a correlation with a nil sequence implies large Gower's norm And the way the numerology works is that if the nil sequence has class S, uh, then the Gower's norm is the S plus 1 norm. So sometimes it's difficult to remember the numerology here. So just to remind you, when I was interested in four-term progression, four term arithmetic progressions, I needed to talk about the Gower's 3 norm, U3 norm. And to understand the Gower's U3 norm, I care about nil sequences of class 2, which are just the step up from abelian. And to work with three term arithmetic progressions, it's the Gower's second norm that's important, and that is related to nil sequences of class 1, which is just abelian Feuer analysis. So for the proof, Um, well, I'm first going to observe a different formula for the Gower's norm. And actually, this is quite a suggestive formula, I think. This is what tells you that the Gower's norm has something to do with derivatives. So first of all, observe that the Gower's norm, Gower's k norm, um, is equal to to the power 2 to the k is equal to the average over h1, hk, and x of the derivative where uh, delta sub h f of x is f of x f of x plus h bar. So that's nothing but a restatement of the definition, but it makes it sort of a bit clear that derivatives have, have some role to play. And hence, you can use this to work inductively with the Gower's norms. So the Gower's u k plus 1 norm to the power 2 to the k plus 1 is the same thing as the average over h of the Gower's uk norm of the derivative to the power 2k. So that's a useful fact. So it turns out that this fact implies a corresponding fact about the dual norms, and it's that fact that we will use to prove this theorem. And that's really very natural because we understand the derivatives. I mean, then we can prove the theorem by induction on S. So on the dual side, um, I claim that. So my claim is that the Gower's dual norm, u k plus 1 of n star, is bounded by the maximum, the supremum over h, of the dual norm of the derivative. to the power 1 half.
OK, so what's, how do we prove that? Uh, well, let f be arbitrary. Uh, then the inner product of f with psi is the same thing as you get by taking the inner product The inner product of f with psi squared is the same as taking the average Now I should say that there are, there are a couple of technical issues here that I'm overlooking. What I write is correct if I replace this 1 up to n by the group z. Um, and then all these averages are over the whole group. If I'm not taking averages over the whole group, I have to be a tiny bit careful. <coughs> but let me ignore that. So this, um, this is just an equality. And just expand it out. And then this is going to be bounded by the average over h of the dual norm of uh, psi. times the, uh, the Gower's norm of f, just by definition of the dual norm. And this will be bounded by the supremum over h of the dual norm times the average over h of this Gower's norm of the derivatives of f. And then I can take Holder's inequality. It lets me raise that to the power 2 to the k. So that's at most the supremum over h of the dual norm of the derivative times the average of this to the 2 to the k to the 1 over 2 to the k. And that's Holder's inequality. And that is basically the end. So this equals sup over h. times the Gower's UK plus 1 norm of f. So that's a, a proof of the statement that I wrote at the top. Let me see if I can just get that back. So let's call that something. So this is a proof of star. So I've basically already told you how that proves the theorem. So we'll prove the theorem by induction. I'll just sketch the proof. Uh, but before you go and apply the induction, you first need to expand phi into vertical characters. So expand <coughs> phi as a sum of, uh, vertical, of automorphic functions with a, a vertical character. Has psi as a vertical character. And then, so just by the norm property, the dual norm of this is at most the sum over psi of the dual norms of those. <coughs> 
Uh, then, then apply star. Oh, sorry. I don't mean Gower's norms of phi. I mean the Gower's norms of phi So here, chi, chi sub psi um, of n is equal to phi sub psi of p of n. So now apply star, uh, but by induction and induction on s. So by induction on the class s and the fact that uh, chi sub psi has class S minus 1. Uh, we're done. So that's, that's what there is to it. A vertical Fourier expansion into automorphic functions with this additional vertical invariance by the center. Then the observation that the derivative of a null sequence of class S is of class S minus 1. And then this fact. So here's an exercise. So if, if you didn't follow any of what I said about groups and filtrations and so on, without any of that, you can convince yourself uh, that the dual norm of e to the 2 pi i alpha n squared in the u3 dual norm is bounded. And the thing is that that's already a vertical frequency. So you don't need to do a Fourier expansion. And so all you need to do there is apply star and then induction. Um, OK. so. I, it's almost 12 o'clock. What I'm going to do is just tell you, I don't know if anyone's still going to be here next week, but if anyone, anyone is, maybe I can help you choose which day to come. So I'll try and make as, in as much as I can three lectures that are independent of one another and relatively independent of what I said so far. So next week, so lecture four, I'm going to talk about uh, distributional properties, properties um, of nil sequences. So this has something it's somewhere halfway between kind of traditional uniform distribution problems in analytic number theory and questions in ergodic theory. So the basic question I'll be asking is, is P of n for n less than or equal to n close to equidistributed? In gamma mod g. So this is really a question about equal distribution on a homogeneous space. So, so it's kind of um, uniform distribution theory theory meets ergodic theory. And then in the fifth lecture, Well, I'm going to then talk about the two applications that I mentioned at the start. So in the fifth lecture, I'll talk a little bit about Semerady's theorem and related issues. And then in the sixth lecture, I will talk about some aspects of linear equations in primes. Um, now these will all use, so this, to talk about distributional properties, 
one does need to use facts about polynomial sequences uh, again, but I'll just, I will recall what I needed. And then to talk about either of these two issues, one needs to use the Gower's norms um, and also things from here and from what I've said this week. Other than that, I, I think I will stop there, but let me just remind you that I have here, well, they're a bit uncorrected at the moment, but um, as long as it's sort of a private thing, if you just email me, I will send you my uncorrected notes. So this means that if you want to read over the weekend everything I've said with all the details from the first three lectures, then you will be able to do so. So send me an email, and my email is ben.green at um, maths.ox.ac.uk. Very important to note that it's Ben and not Benjamin, because there is somebody called Benjamin Green at Oxford, and that's a different person to me. He does not have these notes. OK, um, so that's it for this week. Here, there should be a square there. Yeah. More general question. So, um, in the theorem, yeah, the proposition is stated at the beginning. So yes. Quite, um, um, is there a way to, to actually, is there a way to do all of this just for the free multiple group? And then, once you have, and say that once you have it for the free multiple group, you can. That's an interesting question. Um, it's quite unclear. It's quite unclear to me whether that's true or not. I'm, I, I would think not. And in any case, I don't see why it would be easier in the free Nilpotent group. It's not even clear to me the sense in which an arbitrary filtration can be seen as a quotient coming from the free Nilpotent group. Because these filtrations can be a lot fatter than just the lower central series. There can be very sort of weak filtrations. But isn't it, is it the case that if you have some nil sequence with respect to a fatter filtration, you can see it as a nil sequence? Yes. Now, well, all of those things are true, and in fact, in that sense, you don't need the notion of polynomial sequence or arbitrary filtration at all, uh, because a, a polynomial nil sequence can in fact be written as just a linear nil sequence, uh, phi of g to the n, adapted to, and this is all automatically adapted to the lower central series filtration on some group. So why did I not do that? Well, the point is that when it comes to think about distributional properties, you can't guarantee that this is nicely distributed. And if you, it's very important to have a theory in which you can get a nicely distributed nil sequence. And to allow that, you have to work in this bigger category of um, polynomial sequences. So it, it, it's not enough to interpret your nil sequence as living somewhere else. You need, to, you need all of the information about the distribution to move to that new setting as well. And it generally uh, wouldn't. Two two thirty on, on Monday. Yes.